So we're going to be in Revelation chapter 15 tonight. But before we get there, I would like to just make mention tonight that um, there is a, a pride event that is going on. And honestly, it's funny, I didn't even know about it until just a couple of days ago when I started getting texts about it. And, um, and I didn't answer them right away because I like to take my time to do my research and really try to figure out what's going on before I start. So many times we can be triggered by emotion. Would you agree with that? And 99.999% and of the time, those triggers from emotion will lead you to do and say things that are not the right way. And so um, I've really been taking some time to uh, talk to other pastors and to just pray and to, um, uh, to, to spend some time in His Word looking for how, how people minister. You know, this is nothing new. Back in Paul's day, sexual immorality was part of their worship service to a lot of the temples that they were at. And Paul wasn't necessarily going into those temples trying to protest in those temples. That's not the way that, that he necessarily ministered. Now, I'm not saying that that would be particularly wrong in and of itself, depending on how it was done. But I spent some time just really trying to dig through the Word and really trying to, um, to figure out what an appropriate response to this is. And one of the first things that I felt like that God responded to me was Psalm chapter 37. If you want to turn there real quick, I'd like to share this Scripture with you. It's one that's really spoke to me through this time. Psalm 37, and we'll just read verses 1 through 12 just for um, the context that we need for tonight. And it says here, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers for they will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in His way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger, and that's what I want you to look at. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. And so one of the things that, that, that I felt like that the Lord really spoke to me about in this was that don't let evil and evildoers and things that evildoers are doing, don't let them trigger your emotions to respond in a way that you respond out of that emotion. Instead, you refrain from anger. You keep trusting in the Lord. You don't, and, and here's the reason I say this. There are many that are trying to get me, and, and they tried to get me to do it in Larksburg too, and I didn't do it. But there are many good friends of mine that are trying to get me to meet down there with them Saturday morning and stand on the picket line and, um, and, and preach and preach and preach. Now let me say something about that. Could that be an appropriate response? Could be. Here's my problem. When I talk to these people, when I see their Facebook posts, and when I see the comments they make, their comments and some of the things they're saying are out of emotion and out of their rage against this particular sin. Now, is this that they are celebrating a sin? Absolutely. No question about it. 
Is it necessarily any worse than any other sin? Not necessarily. And so one of the things that we have to understand is that I believe that we have to be careful that we don't respond to things like this out of emotion. Now let me say this. I understand the response. I understand the trigger. I understand the anger. Yes, it angers me that we can be a community of people that would celebrate pride in sin. Celebrate rebellion against our Creator. That's sad, right? That is. And I understand the trigger. I understand the anger. But at the same time, I don't believe that we are wise to allow that trigger and that emotion to cause us to respond in a way of anger, in a way of hate, in a way that... And my concern with what is going to happen down there Saturday morning, it might, it might not. But my concern is that it will more likely turn into a hate-filled, anger-filled rage than it will any good that will be accomplished. Now because of that, my advice to you as a pastor is to be angry, but don't sin. Be angry, but don't involve yourself in a way that causes you to be caught up in something that is not a godly response in a way that will accomplish no good whatsoever. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now I will say this. There is a very small group of us that are going to meet down there Friday night. We And I'd ask you to keep this to yourself because this is going to get a lot of media attention and we're not trying to bring attention to ourselves as we do this. But there's a very small group of pastors and preachers that have, have rented the place down there Friday night to go down there and just pray over it. We're going to write some Scriptures up and fold them up and put them in places to where if people pick them up and open them, they'll read them. Uh, we're, just going to, we're just going to do some things that we believe that we can do as we wait for God to act on our behalf. So I, I am saying, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to advise you is this. Yes, is it right for us to be angry that in our community that we have an event going on that invites our children to come out and watch men that want to dress out in... In, in women's clothing. Yes, it makes me angry. It does make me angry. But I need to be careful with my response to that. And I need to understand that there is a response to this that will produce something that will produce something godly, and there is a response to this that will produce something ungodly as well. I don't want to be a part. Now, if I knew and I could trust that we could go down there Saturday morning and we could have a group of people down there that literally would have conversation with these people that maybe would hand out bottled water and would, um, would literally stand against the sin but just preach the gospel in a way that shares with them the love that we actually have for them through the gospel of Jesus Christ, you better believe I'd be a part of that. You better believe I'd be a part of it. But because of what I've already seen happen in Lawrenceburg when this happened over there, I have a precursor of what is probably going to take place Saturday morning, more than likely, unless they learned a lesson over there. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm advising you as my pastor, stay away from that Saturday morning. Just stay away from it. Spend your time in prayer praying for these people. Maybe if you know somebody that is involved in this lifestyle and may be a part of it, maybe that's your opportunity to call them up and just talk to them. Just ask the question. My question to somebody like that would just be, why is it that you have pride in this? Does it concern you the way that God views this and what God has to say about this? Does it concern you that one day we're all going to stand in judgment before Him and give an account, me for my sin and you for your sin? And this is going to be the result of it if we don't repent and put our trust in Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? There is a way to go about this so that we stand on the things that are godly and the things that are right and that we produce godliness in the process of it. And so my advice to you, and I talked to another pastor today and he told me, he said, I got some church members that are bound and determined that they're going down there Saturday morning. And I said, you know, brother, I said, I get it. You can't stop people from responding to this. And again, they may go down there Saturday morning and it may be an appropriate response. Can I say that? It could be. 
But I feel like, more than likely, it's not going to be. And it's not going to accomplish any good. As a matter of fact, I believe two things are going to happen. Number one, it's going to put a black eye on the church. That's the first thing I believe is going to happen. And the second thing is going to happen is it's going to expose this sin even more. And it's going to create even more of this uprising. And, and, and I ultimately believe that that's nothing that we want to accomplish in this situation. Again, that's my personal opinion. I believe when I go to the Scriptures, I believe that I see there are better ways to approach this. There are better ways to, to preach the Gospel. Uh, you know, here's the thing about it. How many of these same people that are going down there Saturday morning are going every weekend to the Booby Bungalow or whatever that one is up there on the, on the interstate? Why not? What? They're shut down. Well, okay. That's why. Okay. They ain't been shut down forever. Right. Right. <clears throat> That's right. And again, I understand that. I get that. And I'm not saying that that the right response is no response. That's not what I'm saying, okay? And, and I'm saying that the response that if you... I don't want to see any of our Wells Baptist Church members a part of the kind of response that I think might take place Saturday morning. Does that make sense? And so as a pastor, I'm advising you to find a different approach. To... That's right. Why ain't we? That's, and that's my point. Um, and so I believe that the right response is to continue the preaching the gospel the way that we're preaching it. To continue sharing the witness of Christ with our friends and our neighbors and, and all of these people, any of these people that we may... You know, they said last year there was over 700 people at this event. If that many people, there's got to be at least one that somebody in here knows is a part of that. What an opportunity to be able to use this as an opportunity to talk to them about it. Why? Again, my question is very simple. Why is it important for you to be prideful about this particular sin? Why is it that you embrace it so? And does it not concern you what God has to say about it? Because I have my sin too. Can I tell you that? Mine may not be homosexuality, but apart from the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm an adulterer at heart. Y'all understand that? I am sexually immoral just as bad as the worst homosexual or drag, drag queen you've ever met apart from the grace of Jesus Christ. Do you get that? And so, yes, I want to share with them about where God has brought me from, about, what, about how God has opened my eyes to fight my sin, to be at war with it, and to follow Him. To understand that there is a far better thing to be looking for than just temporary passing pleasures. Here today and destroy you tomorrow. So that's one of the first things. And I know there was somebody when I when I mentioned this today, there was there was uh, one one person that said to me, he said, But but our community is falling to sin. Are we just supposed to sit back and and just let these things rise up and, and fall to sin? Let me explain something to you that you may not understand. Everybody go to Romans chapter 1. That's right. Romans chapter 1. You're not giving your community over to sin. Not at all. You are actually a light in the midst of darkness. Period. That's what you are. Now, in Romans chapter 1, I want you to notice in verse um, 18, start there. It says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So God is already making it known that He's displeased with sin, okay? God is making it very clear. And He says that it's made known who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. For although they knew God, 
They did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And here's how they did it. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Doris, would you give me a water, please? <coughs> Excuse me. Now, keep going with me. In verse 24, Therefore, here's the result of it. What did God do? Gave them up to do what? To the disarming of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than, that rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God did what? Gave them up to what? For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And then look at verse 28. Here's what's important. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God. So here's the problem. The ultimate problem is they don't want to acknowledge God, right? They want what they want. And as a result of that, what did God do? Alright, now keep going. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. And I could go on and on, but here's the point behind it all. You're not giving your community over to sin. God has already gave it up. Now, do we have a responsibility to shine as lights in the midst of darkness? Yes, we do. Should we have be involved in politics and, and in trying to make laws that, 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 that will cause our community to pursue God? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But again, I don't believe that just because you don't go down there and protest Saturday morning that you are just standing back doing nothing and you're just giving your community up to God. No, this shouldn't surprise you. The Bible just laid it out for you in plain English that this is ultimately where all sinful hearts are headed unless they finally acknowledge God and quit worshiping and serving the creation and worship and serve Him. And ultimately... Every culture continues to go down that path. And our job is we're lights in the midst of darkness that we're different. We're not following that same path that they follow. We're not involved in pride. We're not involved in those kinds of things. Instead, we are following the Lord Jesus Christ and trying to become more and more like Him every day. And we're simply preaching the gospel. And you know what Jesus told His disciples? If you preach the gospel and they don't, and they don't listen to you, you know what your response is? You know what else he said? Don't throw your pearls before the swine to be trampled on. You know what he meant when he said that? Don't throw what is holy to people that are just going to trample under it. Don't take what's precious and throw it out there for people to trample on. Now again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't go down there and lovingly preach the gospel. If that's what we can do Saturday morning, by all means, let's go. Let's go love on these people. Let's go, let's go share the truth of Jesus Christ with them. Absolutely. Do I believe that's what's going to take place Saturday morning? No, I don't. And so I believe our appropriate response is to find another way around this and not yoke ourselves up with that response. All right? So that's the way I believe that we are to approach this and the way that we are to take this. I believe that our response is simply prayer and keep preaching the gospel. Keep showing the kindness of God towards sinners and keep bidding him, bidding people like this that His wrath is coming on all sinners. And if we don't turn from our sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will perish for an eternity. And that is the, 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 the plea that we have. We plead with people, be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I believe it is. We are ambassadors to Christ. Please be reconciled to God. And there is a way to go about that that is not filled with anger 
and is not filled with hate and bashing and name calling. And that's one of my biggest problems is one of my best, one of my good friends is going to be down there preaching that, that day. And in one of his comments I read was, the gays are this and this and this and this. And I heard in his comment, that as godly as I believe this guy is, and as much as I love him, he was triggered by emotion, not by the gospel. Y'all see what I'm saying? And that is the wrong way to approach this. That is the wrong way to approach this. So again, it may be appropriate for some people to go down there Saturday morning if they can lovingly preach the gospel in a way that genuinely wants to share with sinners that we have to turn from the error of our way. But if that's not what is going to take place and you get caught up in the middle of something that is ungodly, you're going to put a black eye on the church of Christ, maybe even this church, which I would appreciate if you wouldn't do, but you would put a black eye on the church of Jesus Christ and then you're just going to bring more attention to the things that they're trying to put pride in and it's just going to build more and more pride and more and more pride and more and more supporters for it. And I don't believe that that's a godly way to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yep. Right. Right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I, I tell my people, especially when we go on mission trips, uh, to remember these are people to be loved, not projects to be completed. These are people to be loved, not a project that needs to be completed. And that's something I think that we as Christians and we as church people could um, could take to heart and learn from. That's exactly right. No, they're not. No, they're not our enemy. I agree. Yep. Uh-huh. Right. And I believe they should be called out. That's right. And, and because that's, again, we biblically we find Jesus doing that. That when we see the Pharisees, for instance, or we, um, so what, especially religious people of any kind that were not living up to hypocrites, basically, he, he called them out. He called them out. And I believe that that's important for us to do. We have to call out false teaching. and We have to call out that. But again, this is a different response altogether. That's right. That's exactly right. I, this don't surprise me. Yeah, don't surprise me at all. All right. Any questions for me? That's right. <laughs> and he can. He can. You know. You know, I would say two things. First thing I would say is we need to be careful that we are gospel motivated. So in other words, I'm not trying to get people off the hook of going and being a part of... You know, you know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to get people off the hook that really don't want to go preach the gospel anyway. I'm looking at what wisdom would call for in this situation. And I want to see what is going to promote the gospel in the best way. 
And I believe that the way that it's probably going to be done Saturday morning through Christians and churches um, is not the best way. And so I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. On the one hand, I want to sit back and I want to trust that God's going to take care of it. But I'm not doing that in a way that says, I just don't want to be a part of it, so I'm not going to respond to it at all. I, I understand. Right. Right. That's right. Yeah. And again, I think that's where we as individuals have to pray for wisdom to know exactly what an appropriate response would be. I can't tell, and that's what I told my fellow pastor. I can't tell any of my church members that it is wrong for you to go down there Saturday morning. I can't do that. Because it very well could be okay for you to do that. But I believe wisdom would say you would be wiser to not approach it in that way and to not yoke yourself up with that particular type of response. Now, I pray for the people that are going down there and I pray that their response is godly and that, that they accomplish a whole lot. Uh, but I don't feel like, again, because I know certain situations and I've seen things before, I don't feel like that's what's going to happen. And so my pastorly counsel to you is to, um, is to find another way to, to approach this. Um, stand against it. Let it be known. You know, I even thought about, because uh, social media, and I normally stay away from social media. I don't hardly do anything on social media. Uh, but <clears throat> because it is such a wide avenue of communication and affects so many, I thought about putting a tr genuine, loving post out there to all the people that are going to attend this Pride Conference. Um, and literally just sharing the Gospel, um, sharing the Scriptures with them. Uh, do I know I'm going to get attacked for it? Why well, yes. But I felt like that it is probably an appropriate response. Um, and so I believe that there is a way for us to stand against these things and for us to to stand up and say that we don't approve of these kind of things, uh, but I believe that we have to be careful how we do that right now. And so, because again, it's because this has triggered an emotion in you. You're not at the bar on Saturday night um, preaching to drunkards, protesting drunkenness, protesting selling alcohol. I mean, you know, so, uh, you know, you have to be careful that you don't let a particular sin, draw up an emotion in you that leads you to respond in an ungodly way. We want to respond to sin with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And every sinner needs it. I... Yeah. Yeah, it was. Go ahead, Bobby. What were you going to say? I agree. Yep. I agree. I agree. And you know, there are some people that are trying to make me look like a coward. There are some people that are trying to make me look like that because I'm not, because I wasn't a part. Matter of fact, the comment that was made was um, one of the guys that did the event in Lawrenceburg, he asked one of my church members, he didn't know he went to church here, but he asked one of my church members, he said, um, hey, I want you to come and be a part of this. Where are you going to church at now? And he said, well, I go, I go to Wells Baptist Church. He said, oh, never mind. Right. That's right. I'm not concerned about it. It don't bother me at all. Um, I don't have to answer to them. I don't have to answer to them. Um, if they want to see me as a coward, that's fine. Um, I don't believe in any sense that I'm a coward because I'm not going down there. I believe the first thing I did when I found out about this is I got in front of my couch on my knees there at my house and I prayed, James chapter 1. I said, God, here's what you promised. Because I didn't know how to respond. I got a text message from somebody that said, Hey, have you heard what is going to be, what is going to be you and your church's response to this? And I couldn't answer it right away because I didn't know. I didn't know what to say. And so I hit my knees 
And I started praying. I said, God, I don't, I don't know how to respond. I said, I don't even know for sure what's going on. I said, but before I start digging and trying to find anything out, you promised me in the book of James that if I ask, if I need wisdom and I ask for it, you'll give it. And then I trusted that when I got up from that prayer that God was going to keep His promise. And I believed that if I did my research and I spent my time with Him, at the end, when I was able to walk away with whatever decision it was, I could walk away in faith and I could say, God, I ask You for wisdom. You gave me wisdom. Here's what I'm walking in. I'm walking in it. I'm trusting You. I don't care what other people say about it. I don't care whether anybody approves of it or disapproves of it. This is the counsel that I believe that God has given me. And as the pastor that God has put over you, I believe this is the counsel I should give you. And so, again, that's my counsel to you. That's what I would ask you and how, uh, that's what, the way I would counsel you to respond to this, to, to the entirety of it all. All right. Amen. Yeah, it I is. Got, I got to laugh at last week because I've never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you been living? Yeah. All right. If y'all would turn to Revelation chapter 15. <clears throat> I won't have time to get a um, get very far into it, but we will at least get a start in it. Revelation chapter 15. I'd like to read let's look at the first uh, first four verses of it. It says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them the wrath of God is finished. Now, this is an important indicator to let us know what chapter 15 is going to be about. You tell me, what do you think chapter 15 on through 16 is going to be about? God's wrath and the finality of it, right? God's wrath has been being revealed for a long time as we read in Romans chapter 1 verse 18, right? The wrath of God is revealed. We've been seeing it all around us. We see it in sicknesses of our bodies and we see it in creation and tsunamis and hurricanes and tornadoes and fires and floods and, and we see it in um, so many different ways we see the wrath of God revealed. But in many ways, we've also seen the kindness of God, haven't we? The grace of God. In spite of all those things I've talked about, has God been good to you? Yeah, He's been good to you. He's been good to me. And the Bible tells us that... Excuse me. <coughs> well, this may be it. <clears throat> How about we just pick up next week in chapter 15? That worked for y'all? I'm going to do my best to preach Sunday morning. You can tell I'm not trying to stay away from you, but... I'm doing everything I can to get my voice back and be able to do this. So um, y'all pray for me and Lord willing, Sunday morning I'm going to start a series on Isaiah and um, <coughs> we're going to go through Isaiah. <coughs>